The Dennis Martin case is one of the missing 411's most unexplainable and most terrifying. From natural explanations like unseen predators to the possibility of supernatural entities beyond our comprehension, nobody's really sure what happened that Father's Day weekend in 1969. Today we're going to break down the clues, stories, legends, and nightmares of the Dennis Martin disappearance. Also, subscribe to his channel, The Lore Lodge on YouTube. If this video interests you, then you'll love what he's doing over there. Check them out at The Lore Lodge, link in the description. <laughs> That's me. It's this guy right here. And Check him out, Lore Lodge. Yeah, it's me, and of course I have to give credit to my videographer and editor, Aiden Thornbury, who couldn't be here with us tonight, but is an integral part of what we did this weekend, as well as what we do every day at the Floor Lodge. So go subscribe, link in the description, immediately. I'm checking. So, we are driving from Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, to do a video on the disappearance of Dennis Martin in person, where he went missing, like the exact location, with Wendigoon. You can get why people were so superstitious about these mountains upon settling them. They're it, it, enormously beautiful. But at the same time, they're really, really dark. <laughs> and the mornings, they'd sit basically coated in mist half the time. It's, I mean, there's a reason they're called the Great Smokies, but I mean, you look around and you're like, okay, I can see why any bump in the night, any twig snapping out of place would probably set somebody off a little bit. Also, if when you get to like a mountain top around mm -hmm. here, and like look down, it is insane how many valleys there are. Like the yeah. mountains just keep rolling. Oh, it's beautiful. It is, it's gorgeous. Doctor enough, I will give you my firstborn. Sponsor me somehow. I don't care, doesn't have to be a lot of money, just send me a free one. I need to be sponsored for my own principal, please. They, uh, was that them? <laughs> was that the doctor enough? <laughs> Drink that. Okay. <laughs> just, you don't have an option. Ooh, I know. That's tasty. It's it's tasty, it's refreshing. Focus on to try. Those are two tongue cones. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of sponsors, I want to take a moment to thank the people who made today's video possible. The home of audio entertainment, Audible. Audible offers a countless selection of books, podcasts, live shows, stand-up shows, and anything else you like. And thanks to Audible Plus, you can get access to a lot of this massive catalog for free. And on top of that, with Audible Plus, you'll be able to select anything from Audible's premium catalog, meaning once a month, you can pick any bestseller and keep it forever. And with Audible Plus, you will have access to Audible's Plus catalog, meaning if you watch this video and feel it wasn't dark or depressing enough, you can go to Audible Plus and find hundreds of podcasts, and book readings that will be sure to keep you up at night. For example, if this video interests you, then you'll be happy to know that Audible has hundreds of podcast episodes and audiobooks covering human disappearances in national parks. Meaning if you want to take the plunge into existential terror and a distrust of the establishment, then Audible is a happy enabler. And on top of all of that, thanks to Audible Originals, Audible has a selection of stories that you literally can't find anywhere else. So if you're interested in crazy conspiracy theories, or hidden esoteric knowledge of the world, or whatever middle gray area we've decided this channel covers, then Audible's the perfect way to listen wherever you are. And right now, you can get in on all of this for free. Because if you go to the link in the description at audible.com forward slash Wendigoon, or text Wendigoon to 500-500, you will be able to try Audible for 30 days free. That is right, for free. You can listen to Audible for 30 days, see how the premium catalog and the plus catalog work, and then if you decide that it's not right for you, you can cancel at any time with no cost to yourself, although I'm sure you'll love it. Again, that's audible.com forward slash Wendigoon or text Wendigoon to 500-500 to get in for free today. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most to see you support these crazy ramblings. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description and we are back to the video. We are gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. So this is Kate's Cove up here on the left for the okay. minute of the loop. Now, I know you want to do this, but when we walk up to the park person, 
don't immediately question them about dead people. I wasn't okay. going to. You, mm. <laughs> I wasn't going I don't to. Trust you. <laughs> I have boundaries. I don't trust you at all. The Aidens are in the bathroom right now, but I just need everyone to know I'm being held captive. I'm here against my will. They've had me at gunpoint talking about missing persons for days now. Someone's. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're here. The question is where's North? Um, that way. You guys oh, that have. Way. Oh. <laughs> All right, so if you're from the region, you don't step onto a pile of leaves on the water. But other than that, very nice. <laughs> did it again. I didn't. No, oh, like, I'm getting made fun of. And this trail is not mapped. That's cool. It's based. I think we should go to the creek. Just follow the creek. Alright, is it back up that way? I think so. You think? Yeah, makes sense. Alright, cool. All right, so did we come up around here? Or oh, come on, right really? This is like scary bad. This is like <laughs> grandpa with dementia bad. I used to be a lot better. How many squirrels do you think you could take? Do I have a weapon? I feel like this is the trail. It says but... do not enter, but I really would like to enter. <laughs> I'm sure this won't come back to hurt us in any way. It's gonna be fine. This definitely won't be a testament to our own hubris. Oh wow, okay, so we really just went in a big circle. Yeah, yeah. but we burned 100 calories. Go ahead, Lewis and Clark. Well, what other option do we have? I think we cross yeah, no, right there. No, no, go for it. Where do you want to go? I insist, just tackle this the way you think is best. That's because you just want to watch me fall in the water again. Yep, yep. It mm -hmm. sure is. Well, joke's on you. I have learned from my experiences, and I will not be falling in the water again. Now he's all defiant. That was crossing the water to you? It's that way. You walked on the bank. <laughs> We're trying to get footage of you. Falling in. Fine. Not a lot of dry rocks. <laughs> oh, speaking of falling. I'm, I did fall in, I fell out. <laughs> we all, we all, bro, we all did it. We're all even now. Uh, we found it. Look, uh, we discovered the lost trail well, yeah, I mean, of with people yeah. dying and yes. 411s this way. Yeah. Russell Field Trail, here we go. Right now, we are following the trail to Russell Field, uh, the Russell Field Trail, also part of the Anthony Creek Trail. This was the first leg of the Martin family trip. Dennis Martin's family did an annual Father's Day trip. And this was the first year that the six-year-old was included. His older brother Doug had done the trip, his dad, his grandfather, a number of other members of the family. To my understanding, this segment of the trip was just Clyde, the grandfather, Bill, the father, Doug, and Dennis. Dennis was four feet tall, 55 pounds, six years old, brown hair, brown eyes, and he was slightly developmentally disabled, but not to any critical extent. He was, by all accounts, a functional young boy, just a little bit slow. There's really no reason to believe that he would have wandered off for any reason, but on this first day, this first leg, they made the trip from the trailhead up to Russell Field. From Russell Field, they took the next step of the trail out to Spence Field, which is where we're headed right now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we get there. Be getting close to the Russell Creek. It's, or, been, sorry. it's been about a mile and a half, I think. Yeah, we should be getting close to the Russell Field, and then Russell Field will take us about another mile to Spence Field. That's where we'll be able to take a look around, show you guys where the kid actually went missing, kind of give you an idea of why search efforts were so hampered by terrain and weather. And the only reason that a kid would head off into the brush would be if they were scared. So, uh, due to weather conditions, we're not going to make it all the way to Spence Field today. But what we were able to find is a bush similar to what we would have seen up at Spence. I mean, it, it was a bush somewhere on this trail, and the bush itself isn't marked, so... Yeah, I mean, the, the, honestly, us picking a bush was going to be as good as doing this. Yeah. So. Point of the matter is, what happened is that on the second day of this adventure, the Martin family reached Spencefield, where they decided to set up camp, and uh, Bill Martin found some other parents of other children and said, hey, the kids should play together. So while well, the adults did what the adults had to do, setting up tents and all that, a group of these children went and played hide and seek and you know, various other campsite games. At one point during these games, Dennis and his older brother, Doug, popped themselves behind one of these bushes along the edge of a trail. 
Now, their plan was to scare some family members, adults, as they came up the trail. The adults, of course, not being born yesterday, saw the kids run behind the bush and didn't really have a problem with it. So, Dennis's father, Bill, saw him go behind the bush. Saw Doug go behind the bush. Wasn't super concerned. A lot of versions of the story that you hear are going to say they were playing hide-and-seek. That does not appear to be the case. It appears to have been specifically that Doug and Dennis were trying to scare their parents. Right. So, yeah. their father, Mr. Martin, yeah. is back at the campsite. He watches his two sons, like, from his point of view, crouch down behind a bush, mm -hmm. and they're going to jump out and scare him. But the yeah. entire time, they're in his line of sight. Yeah. He had his eyes off of them for maybe a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. And when they called everybody in saying, all right, you know, time to end the game. Let's come back to the campsite, regroup, you know, dinner, all that. Doug came back. The other kids came back. Dennis did not. Bill thought, you know what? He's probably just, just continuing the game. We'll give him a couple more minutes. Maybe he's still trying to scare me. Exactly. You know? But after a few minutes, he got a little tired of waiting. Went to check on Dennis. Dennis was not behind the bush. So the very first thing that Bill does is shout, I can't find Dennis. Everyone starts looking for him. Adults, older kids, and Bill himself bolts down this trail about two miles looking so for So he would son. have ran right along here yes. on the way down. Uh, or possibly one of these trails. Yeah. He, ran, he ran down one of yeah, them. Yeah, it's yeah. unclear exactly which trail he ran down, right. but he ran down the trail. If you're running down a trail, it would have to be this one because yeah. the others are lateral. So Yeah. Now, he did not see Dennis. Nobody coming up the path saw Dennis. And after a few hours of searching the immediate vicinity, they decided to contact the rangers. Rangers launched a search. This was, again, uh, June 15th. Rangers launched a search. Right. What transpired over the next uh, approximately 10 days was one of the largest organized manhunts in a national park. They had over 250 search and rescue volunteers. They actually had to cut off the number of volunteers because they couldn't actually wrangle them together and appoint enough leadership to get these groups to be successful. There's so too many. Yeah. they cut off the road that comes up where we parked. Mm -hmm. They cut that road off. And then they called in the National Guard. They called in rangers, police, basically anyone they could get their hands on. Uh, a couple days in, I believe the 17th or the 18th, the FBI got involved. And on the 17th or the 18th, again, it isn't. it's one of those two days, approximately two dozen Green Berets, mm. who were training locally, were dropped here. Now, this is prior to, uh, you know, the Green Berets becoming quite what they are today. Right. Back then, they were a little bit more of a guerrilla warfare reconnaissance kind right. of deal. Cooler. So, but still, like, you know, this, this was their jam. This is what they did. Right. So, called in about two dozen. And that number, over the course of the next few days, would increase to over 70. 72 mm. to 74 Green Berets. So, we've got 250 official volunteers. Yep. The road's cut off, Lord knows how many random people walking through the woods, mm -hmm. and 70 Green Berets. Yep. All looking for this one kid. Yep. Who couldn't have been away from his dad for more than, at Couple most, minutes. five minutes. Yep. And, you know, if you look around, if you want to pan and show the people, uh, you know, the, the brush can get pretty thick right. around here. Yeah. And where we are right now is actually rather thin for how this trail has been. Yeah. This is one of the more open areas. Yeah. By far. But... Again, we're talking about a four-foot-tall six-year-old. Right. He's not going to have the upper body strength to climb these nearly vertical, you know, hillsides. We're right. looking at we're looking at 60, 70 degree slopes here. Yeah. He's not going to have the upper body strength to climb up that. So he's going to have to be, you know, basically going down. If anything, they did not find him. Now, what they were able to do was have dogs track his uh, his prints, his scent, down to a creek. Um, I don't think it was Anthony Creek. We'll You'll show see you what it is. You'll yeah. see the creek will be somewhere right here, probably. Right. They traced him down to the creek, and after the creek, dogs lost his scent. Now, mm. there was a group of Boy Scouts in the area aiding the search. One thing that is important to note about Boy Scouts, uh, they follow the buddy system at right. all times. You will never have a Boy Scout wandering alone unless they have they done something wrong. They don't just send children out yeah. into the woods. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah I mean, Christ. we're talking about 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds here. Yeah. So, the Boy Scouts are looking around. The dogs trace Martin's scent down to a creek. And what they find in the creek bed is footprints. Mm. One bare foot and one chewed foot. The sole imprint matched Dennis's shoes. However, the rangers said that according to Dennis's father, and there's actually no record of this, they just say in their 
report. In the Ranger's account. Yeah, there's no external record of Dennis's father ever saying this. It's just in the Ranger report. Right. They say that Bill Martin said that shoe print is too big to be Dennis's. So, the official account is that the Ranger said the father said it, but you couldn't find anywhere that the father had actually no. stated that, that the shoe print was too big. I could not corroborate the National Park Service's story on that. And the barefoot shoe mm -hmm. print, was it like a child's? It was definitely child size. Okay. But they argued that it looked more like a 10-year-old than a 6-year-old. Okay. And they said it was probably just one of the Boy Scouts. Now, here's the problem with that. They had all the Boy Scouts accounted for, and for every Boy Scout, they had two shoes. Right. There wasn't was a single Boy Scout there, missing a shoe. It's unlikely one of the boys was out looking barefoot. Alone, bare, half barefoot. Like. So were the two footprints side by side to imply that the barefoot person and the shoed person were walking together? Or, or, no, it was... It, it was one foot was bare, one foot had shoes. Oh, I've yeah. said, now I'm learning. Look at that. Okay. Yeah, so it was one set of footprints, one with a shoe, one not. Right sole pattern to be Dennis Martin's shoes. Okay. The Rangers report is that the father said the feet were too big. Yes. Okay. They did not pursue the trail across the creek, officially. From the 22nd to the 25th, mm -hmm. when the search was suspended, there is no record of what the Green Berets were up to. Their communications channel was completely separate from the National Park Service and the National right. Guard, which is standard. Correct, but, yeah, the Green Berets do that. But there's but that no, record, there's no record yeah, of it. Yeah. For the first five days the Green Berets are involved, there's pretty meticulous recording of everything that's going on. And then suddenly, on the 22nd, reporting of the Green Berets activity stops. And when did the Green Berets actually leave? The 25th. So there's a three day period of time where the Green Berets were still looking, but nothing is recorded. It's not been logged. One of the theories is that the rest of the searchers were basically told, oh, don't worry about the creek. It's a, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. Gotcha. And the Green Berets kept looking on that other side of the creek. Hmm. That is, again, the theory. So the same day that the Green Berets leave, oh, I did forget to mention a little tidbit here. It didn't really help with the search because they couldn't find anything, but a man by the name of Tony Stark supplied two helicopters to the search team. Um, which I just... You have to mention that. You gotta mention. You gotta I, bring it up. Iron Man went looking for Dennis yeah, Martin. Like, <laughs> we had the Green Berets. We had Iron Man. If anyone was going to find this kid, they it would, would have been be the Iron ones Man. to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay, Iron Man too. <laughs> but the people they had out yeah. here would have done it. Yeah, yeah, it would have been the Green Berets. Especially considering we're talking about a five-year-old kid in foliage like this having five minute head start yeah but all the adults are the search rescue crew couldn't find him in how big of an area um it was i think approximately 20 square miles yeah that's like the next hillside over the parking lots yeah. over pretty much the entirety of cade's yeah. cove and the region around it and to tie this into another missing 401 case there is a story i believe the name is keith perkins i might be mixing up my names here but i believe it's keith perkins who was actually younger he was about three mm -hmm. and in his case he went missing and showed up 22 hours later, 12 miles away. Right. Nobody's sure how he did that. Mm -hmm. And Les Stroud, Survivor Man, uh, tried to recreate that trek and mm -hmm. could not do it in the same time period. So, adults can't cross that distance. Now, apparently, three-year-old Keith Perkins could, right, inexplicably, yeah. which suggests that perhaps he was... He mentioned a cat. Mm -hmm. Perhaps he like was dragged a, off a by something, just, you know, like, and carried him twelve miles. Small out, child, you know? traumatic experience. Yeah, um, that's basically the only way it could have feasibly happened. But again, a cougar dragging someone twelve miles it's is weird. still weird. And then drop. So him. yeah, but yeah. point of the matter is, in brush like this, you know, even adults, especially can't make that like the kid was in the line of sight. Yeah, right? if he had gone down the trail, which again, get going through the brush here is hard, near impossible. Yeah. Especially for someone that small. Right. So if he was to escape, he would have been going up or down the trail. Right. Nobody on the trail saw him. Which Especially means the only option is he went in. Even the bush. if he was to like make a break for it, right? Mm -hmm. The father's like seeing the bush over there. Yeah. And he's like walking towards it. It would have had to be like directly away from the family mm -hmm. into the thicket. So yep. that leads people to think, well, maybe it was like a kidnapper of yep. some kind, right? Maybe someone took him. But even then, the child didn't make any noise. People were searching everywhere mm -hmm. for him. And then, like, even if it is one dude who kidnapped this kid, mm -hmm. the idea that 250 people and 70 Green Berets, that he was 70 Green Berets enough on to top of the them. 250 Yes, people. yeah, correct. Yeah. Like, and that he left no tracks? Yeah. That nobody heard him? They, dogs couldn't find? Yeah, yeah, the dogs were able to trace him to a creek, and that was it. No evidence, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a couple of stories that spring out of this, because on the 25th, search was suspended. Right. They could not find him. There was essentially no chance that after nearly two weeks... He was still alive out there. Right. So, unfortunately, they had to make a very difficult decision to suspend the search and presume him dead. Right. For the conspiratorially minded, 
there are a couple of things that come up here. There is, first and foremost, that three days where the activities of the Green Berets on the ground are not recorded. Right. So some people suggest that they did think something was over there, and they thought it was something that the public was not in a position to accept, mm -hmm. whether that be Bigfoot or, you know, feral wild men out in the woods, whatever it was. The idea is that the Green Berets directed everybody away from that area so that they could focus on it and handle whatever was going on in there. We don't have any record of what happened. Obviously, there is no way to corroborate that theory. Right. But a lot of people do look at it, and when you think about the way Special Forces operates, it does kind of work. Right. What would they have been after? Who knows? Who knows? Another thing that comes up is another couple sometime later mentioned that while they were camping nearby... They spotted something strange up on one of these ridge lines. Honestly, considering this was June, I don't know how the hell they saw anything past these ridge lines. They would have to be pretty close. Yeah. There are a few places through these hills where you can have a sort of embankment where you can look up at a ridge line, or yeah. they could have just been close to the ridge line. True. So it's not impossible, but it would have to be an ideal line of sight. Yeah, exactly. So what they reported was that they saw what they described as either a large hairy man or a large, unusually hairless bear running on two legs, upright, with something slung over its shoulder, up a ridgeline. Neither is a good option. Neither of these things are good options. And even if you go with something very mundane, like the unlikely event that a cougar came up, snacked on him, and got away without leaving a single trace, that's still awful. That's still Like, horrific. there's still no good it's situation. Still, like, yeah, the most plausible scenario is still horrifying. The idea that a five-year-old boy with an eyesight of his dad on a very well-hiked and documented trail that a bear, a cougar, or a person mm -hmm. could come up behind him, grab him to where he makes no noise, even with his brother right next to him, as mm -hmm. close as we are in the bush together, and that it could drag him away mm -hmm. and not be found by a frantic sprinting dad, yep. the entire friends and family who searched over the next days, 250 rangers, 70 Green Beret, can, whatever it is, can elude all of them and wipe this kid off the face of the earth. Yep. It's terrifying. Even and, without bringing in any conspiracy-esque ideas. Exactly. You, you can leave the paranormal completely out of this. You can leave right. aliens out of it. You can leave Bigfoot out. It's still inexplicable. Yeah. And I think that is the core of these Missing Forum 1 type cases. It's not necessarily that there has to be something paranormal going on, but they are completely unexplainable in so many cases. There yeah. are some where there is a plausible explanation, but it seems unlikely. There, there's a few that you could imagine, maybe if someone wanted this person got, or maybe just yeah. a random kidnapping, it makes sense. Yeah. But even if this was a random kidnapping of some sort, the things like the dogs not being able to find them, the half-shoed yeah. set of footprints through the river. That's the weirdest one to me. And no one being able to, like 70 Green Braids, being unable to find a clue about this person, except for a supposed three-day blacked out yeah. history it, report. It really is. They find those tracks. The park it. service says, nope, can't be him. And then the Green Berets go silent. Walked into the river and off the face of yeah. the earth. To, to me, I, I will be honest, to me, it does sound like when they found that shoe mark and the Green Berets went silent, that doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. Again, I don't know. I have no proof of what happened. Mm -hmm. But that seems odd, in my opinion. You're thinking the national parks are up to no good. I mean, that's why I'm here. <laughs> All right, fair That's enough. how we got here. <laughs> that's why I'm in the woods with Windagoon right now in front of a random bush. <laughs> that's why I'm here. Stop that. Uh, you know, to date, Dennis Martin is not the only person to go missing in this park. Right. There have been adults, actually been a number of adults. Uh, the National Park Service does say that they don't keep a list of people who go missing in the parks, except for the list that they keep of people who go missing in the parks that's published on their website. Mm -hmm. uh, what they don't do is keep a full comprehensive list. Right. They really only keep the it's ones that are public. It's just for active missing persons yeah. and people who be on the lookout for them. Yeah. This week. yeah. What they like to do is have a, a, a list of the widely known public cases. Mm -hmm. And then if you call them and say, hey, can we get a list of people who went missing in the national parks? They say, well, that's going to cost you $20,000. And uh, it's going to take us several months to compile. And then when that person puts up the money, uh, you tell them you're never getting that list and hang up the phone. Uh, and by you, I mean the National Park Service's lawyers. It's interesting that's gate kept that much. We're going to get blacklisted from National oh, Parks. Oh, absolutely. It's going to get to the point where it's like, oh, let's get a map. And they're like, "If you, you'll be shot instantly. <laughs> yeah. It's also a known thing. It's just someone who's local to like the Smoky Mountains. That you do not come into these woods alone. 
Yeah. Not just like, oh, Bigfoot UFO like you were talking about. There are things that go bump in the night, most of them natural, at least all the ones we know of are natural. <laughs> None of them good. None of them something that you want to deal with. Yeah. Not to mention, as we mentioned earlier, the elements can be very unfriendly out here. Yes. You'll get very hot and very cold. It gets very dark. I, uh, as and you very can wet, see, as um, you can see, yeah. This is not from rain. This is sweat. Mm -hmm. And then we stopped for a minute to rest, and I very quickly got very cold. Yes. So yeah. even though it's probably about 65 degrees right now. You're cold. You've got a breeze coming down off the mountain. You've got the river right there. And what happens is you get water all over your body. And then as it gets darker, it gets more and more cold like it is. What eventually happens is you're soaked from sweating during the day. And then you're freezing at night, mm -hmm. which is not a condition anyone no, needs not. to be in, especially several miles out, a hike away mm -hmm. from the road. These woods are not kind, even if you do everything yeah. correctly. And I think it's a testament that with the case like Dennis Martin, you have all these people out here, everything to prevent something bad from happening mm -hmm. in place. Yep. And something bad still happens. The world is cruel. The world is cruel. The woods are nice, but they're not kind. He would have been, basically he would have crossed to the eastern side of Eagle Creek. And been somewhere around Jenkins Trail Ridge in this yeah, area. Covering the camera. Sorry, somewhere in Jenkins Trail Ridge. <laughs> Wherever Dennis we're was. Still, we're still in the search area. This is like Yeah, the Dennis's place, yeah. last suggested location would have been somewhere about two, three miles southeast of where we are right now. That, that is, is, that is following the prints. Yes, that is the assuming the prints that are his. Yeah. One thing I found odd was there was a disagreement over what kind of shoes Dennis was wearing in the reports. One mm. suggested he was wearing loafers, and the other suggested he was wearing tennis shoes. Tennis so. shoes seemed significantly more likely. So um, why would you wear loafers up here? Yeah. yeah, so I don't know. Well. Shut up. Pay him back up. <laughs> this is called drip. It's different. The point is, th that's a weird inconsistency. Right. And if they couldn't be sure what kind of shoes he was even wearing, how could they possibly be sure if they were the right size? Yeah, right. Um, that, that seems fishy Is that to what me. further it's, makes you th it, discount the idea that the dad was like, these are clearly yeah. not his? Yeah, Yeah. because like the dad would have been able yeah, to Yeah, also, why the dad who's like, Running through these hills, freaking out, trying to find his son. Be like, nah. Why would it then, it's like, oh, this is an mm -hmm. exact match to your son. Yeah. And he's like, looks more like a nine-year-old to me. Yeah, <laughs> like, like no, nah, it just doesn't make any sense. We, we should leave this. Come yeah. on, guys, let's go back up the hill. It, it seems to me like they had a feeling Dennis was on the other side of that creek for some reason or another. And that the only people they could trust to keep whatever they found secret were special forces. That's, All right, so I'm whether going, it's again, even if that means it was just a mountain lion that dragged him off, I'm going to offer a counter theory just okay. so we don't get executed by park services. Perhaps with cases like this, say it's mm. national parks, right? Yeah. What might have happened is they get to that stage and they see the shoe print. For whatever reason, they think it's not a missing person anymore. They think it's a murder. Mm -hmm. They think it's a abduction. They think it's something along those lines. Right. Something that the national park doesn't want to deal with, yeah. right? Because that's police problems. That's yeah. like the county. And the so, FBI was involved. Okay, yeah. So what might have happened is they're doing this search, and then they see that, or they find some clue that it was a human abduction, yeah. like an adult grabbed him or whatever, and they are like, I didn't see that. Let's go this way, yeah. Because let, then, let law enforcement and I'm not saying that yeah. they like hid information. Yeah. I'm saying that perhaps they pass the information on to the local authorities yeah. and we're like, you should do an investigation in that direction because legitimately, not even conspiratorial, that is out of their jurisdiction, yeah. a oh, human yeah. kidnapping. So maybe it's just something they wanted to pass off to the police instead of handling it, it themselves. It was within FBI jurisdiction. Correct. It was on federal land. That's true. So my, what I'm thinking is they probably did continue searching that side of the creek and it was probably special forces and FBI mm. in tandem. That's it, more than likely. Yeah, that seems like the most rational. That's also more than me. likely why the comms dropped yeah. for those three days. And the FBI is also very bad about, I know from personal experience, very bad about <laughs> releasing information, yeah. especially when it comes to missing persons and murder cases. So perhaps over those three days, it moved into an FBI jurisdiction and they just kept it to themselves, which is why the Green Berets records were no longer logged. However, what did they find in those three days? That is the question. That's the question. That's what we don't know. And also... What we know they didn't find is Dennis Martin. We know they didn't find his body, because if they would have found his body, that would have been the end of it. Yeah. If they would have found him, regardless of their 
you know, looks, people were still searching, yeah. regardless of how much they were looking for him. So the FBI would have been like, here's the body, or uh, we found him alive or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we know they didn't get that. Yeah. So what was discovered in those three days? And why wasn't it locked? Those are the questions we're not going to get answers to. Yeah. This is, this is phase one. <laughs> if you're an FBI whistleblower and you're watching no, this video, no, 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 <laughs> contact I have the Lord. I have at enough weird emails already. <laughs> Stop. All of the people who are in my emails periodically asking me if I want to do something like rob the Pentagon, email him from now on. I'm tired of and these And I will get in touch with Isaiah. Stop. <laughs> Don't show my face. Cut this out. What are the scenarios that you think would have been the case for them to, even if they had found him? to not inform everyone else that they had found him and continue the search. Not necessarily in terms of like letting them keep look because like they need to find him, but more because they don't want anyone else knowing what they found. Right. I can't think of a scenario, as much as I despise them, <laughs> I can't think of a scenario where the feds found a kid and were like, we'll just keep this to ourselves. It would have had uh, to be unless something- Unless the kid of some like, had, had like the, the national treasure yeah, <laughs> key no. to him. I don't think I, there's a way. Only feasible reason I could see is that it was something so absurdly horrifying for whatever reason that they decided it was best not to inform the public. It is, of course, possible that they privately informed the family of what they found. That is true. There are some cases where people are found and they just tell the family. Yeah. So it could have been that they found him in such a condition that it would have been upsetting. So it does go both ways. There are cases where the FBI Park Service, what have you, will alert the public to a super grisly occurrence. It in this could case, be a child. where it was a five year old, a minor, mm -hmm. who the family was searching for him, that something was found and they went and told the family, we found this. That could be what's in the three day report. It yeah. They could have found the body in such a condition. And that would also make sense because it was 1969. Yep. It's not like there would have been, you know, television cameras and a big press release. Despite over 300 people being involved in the search. Yeah, no TikTok, no Twitter. Yeah, they could have just privately went to the family and said, we found the remains. It wasn't good. It wasn't pretty. Yeah. And the family, I mean, maybe some of the people involved know. I do think it'd be weird that 300 people were involved and no one ever had clarity and then spoke about it later. Yeah. But perhaps in those final days, just the family received their answer and didn't make it publicly known. However, that still asks the question, if he was found dead, something still took him away from the yep. trail and all those people that quickly and that quietly. And what was it? What was it? Yeah. That's, that's the thing about this specific case is every time you answer a question, there's another, there's another question. question. Yeah. So <laughs> if he was, if he was not kidnapped, which he still could have been kidnapped, yeah. but if he was murdered, if he died of exposure or what have you, something still took him away from everyone that fast that over 300 people couldn't find him. Exactly. And that's the thing, because it's like, when you go, when you follow the story all the way through to the point where it's like, if they found him and didn't acknowledge it to the general public, if it was a bear or a cougar or something, it's already known that that exists here. Right. My head's immediately going to, if the public found out about this, they wouldn't come to the park anymore. Mm, yeah. What might be that scenario? Could also be inbred cannibals and the Tennessee wild man. Yes. Yep. I'm not sure I believe in the inbred cannibal stuff. But the wild man. Possible. <laughs> <laughs> this state is full of cannibals, incestuous monster men, and lice. So don't move here. If you're not from the region and you come here, you will die every day. Like I had to kill three this morning. They'll try to eat your dog. Don't come. Now the Dennis Martin case, as with any case of disappearances in Appalachia, of course, has some scary stories attached to it. And those are what we're gonna talk about here. Shortly after Dennis Martin disappeared and after the search had been suspended, a couple reported seeing what they claimed was either a very hairy man or an oddly hairless bear running on two legs up a ridge. And slung over that bear man's shoulder was what appeared to be a small child. The police and the park rangers couldn't actually corroborate this report, but it does tie in fairly well to local Appalachian folklore. See, stories of hairy people or these humanoid figures in the woods kidnapping someone, especially children, is sadly nothing new. Now, while creatures like this have many names in the Appalachian wilderness, one of the most famous, especially for the state of Tennessee, 
is that of the Tennessee Wild Man. Legends of the Tennessee Wild Man date back to the 1800s, with stories from the Civil War of soldiers coming across this seven to nine foot tall hairy beast with deep piercing red eyes running through the tree line. Early sightings of the wild, <clears throat> early si early stories of the wild man hold everything. You got this. Thank you. <laughs> early stories of the wild man showcase him as everything from a creature that steals the wounded off the battlefield or food from storage houses to something that simply just stands in the tree line watching for some reason. Accounts of the wild man can vary from specifics like the color of his hair being anything from gray or black to a light blonde or brown. But some of the consistencies throughout the sightings are that he is of course very tall, possesses deep red eyes, has a horrific smell as blood or something dead, and lets out these deep guttural shouts. Uh. <laughs> I'm at my limit. Now the earliest story that specifically gives an origin to the Tennessee Wild Man comes from the 1870s in McNary County in the southwest corner of the state. According to this story, as legend has it, a carnival was making its way through the southern part of Tennessee when it, one of the members of its freak show act, Tall Hairy Man, escaped from its enclosure one day and has roamed the countryside ever since. The story even made its way into the media with local newspapers discussing a tall, hairy, wild man who was out and about looking to kidnap local women. There were legitimate warnings going around all over southern Tennessee, and it seems like they were taken seriously in many cases. Now while this account of the wild man relegates him to a single individual acting alone, several of the other stories suggest that perhaps there's several wild men out in these hills. Sightings of the wild man date as recently as 1995 and as far east as Elizabethan and the North Carolina border. The most recent account comes from Rob Phillips, and he told the story in 2015 to several media outlets, including a couple of TV channels who were featuring the story. But most importantly, he says that everything took place around 1995, which would explain why there weren't any, you know, cell phone camera videos or GoPro footage of it. But what he described was that he and his cousin, Randy Sparks, were on a hike to a set of cliffs, and what they came across was nice little rainstorm, you know, the weather getting a little chilly, and it must have been pretty dark because from what they said, they started to hear twigs snapping, and then they started to smell something dead, the, the scent of rotten flesh or old meat, something along those lines. And then they heard something scream, and at this point they booked it, and according to Rob, he actually lost his cousin somewhere in the darkness of this rainstorm in the midst of the woods, and he found himself huddling up against a tree hoping not to be found by whatever it was that was stalking him through the woods. Unfortunately for him, when he looked at the tree in front of him, about 15 feet away and 20 feet up, what he saw was what, by his estimation, was a seven to nine foot tall, charcoal gray colored, hairy beast of a man with bright red eyes, fur that he described as neither coarse nor fine, and a pretty horrifying screech. It scared him so much that he just booked it for the car, where he actually was able to rendezvous with his cousin, and they just immediately got out of there. What's interesting about the Tennessee Wild Man is, for one, you're probably thinking to yourself, that sounds a lot like Sasquatch. And yes, that's true. The primary difference between the two, at least through most local accounts, is that while Sasquatch is often described as an ape that has the form of a man, the Tennessee Wild Man is more so described as a man who has the form of an ape. What I mean by that is creatures like Sasquatch typically have this connotation in our mind of being a sort of primate-like creature, but sightings of the Tennessee Wild Man are very particular in that it has the face and eyes of a human. And what's particularly interesting about the Tennessee Wild Man, to anyone who's familiar with folklore of Appalachia, is that while this is one name given to a creature of this description, there are several other creatures fit this description as well. One of these examples is that of the Flintville Monster, a creature that, according to a woman in the 1970s, she witnessed running across the field in front of her house up to her front door trying to snatch her young child. The mother quickly barreled out the front door and grabbed her kid before ducking inside and quickly caught a glimpse of something that she said was covered with black fur, ran like a dog, and had the face of a man. After calling the police, the police canvassed the area and all that they found 
were large humanoid barefoot footprints and blood soaked on the tree line. Again, the Flintville monster matching this description of the Tennessee wild man. It seems that depending on when a creature was found and who attributed a name to it, some of these things are treated as entirely different entities, at least in folklore history. But as it seems, there's nothing saying the two can't be one and the same, or at least the same kind of creature. Another example of this is a creature known as the White Screamer. According to one account, in the 1920s, a farmer in Middle Tennessee reported that over several nights, he heard some kind of screaming or whooping coming from the tree line outside of his property. Night after night, his wife and children would complain that they couldn't sleep because it sounded like whatever this thing was kept getting closer. After a week, the farmer was tired of it, so he grabbed a shotgun and decided to chase into the woods after it. However, after following wherever this noise was coming from, it kept getting further away like it was trying to run from him. The farmer doubled down and began to sprint through the forest, desperate to stop whatever this thing was that kept his family up at night. What he didn't realize was happening is that this screaming was leading him in a circle all the way back to his home. And whenever the farmer realized that the screams had turned from the screams of whatever this creature was into the screams of his dying family, it was already too late. He ran into his household to find that his wife and kids had been eviscerated, torn apart, the white walls now stained red across their house from whatever this screamer was. And the farmer said that as he stood there in agony, he looked out the door and saw something he described as an ape with the face of a man running into the hills. These legends aren't limited to white settlers in the area, though. Back in the times before European colonization of the American continent, the Cherokee had their own stories, something they called the Tsulkalu. Now, one of the most prominent versions of this story describes a young woman who needed to get married, but she would only marry a great hunter. It was all her mother would accept. So, one night while she was sleeping in the outhouse, as they called it, not the outhouse you and I might understand, but sort of a cabin outside of the main building, she woke up to find a giant sitting in her room. And the giant was kind, it was friendly, but it was hairy and large, and she was... A little bit scared at first, but it promised her that it was a great hunter. And it proved it. And eventually, the young Native American girl decided to get married to the giant. But its appearance was so fearsome that it scared the mother, and the giant's feelings were hurt such that it took his wife and went off into the mountains to live with its own kind, suggesting that the Cherokee natives did believe that there was a race of beings out there who matched to some extent, the description of the Tennessee wild man. A large creature, this time sometimes described as carrying a weapon and stealing cattle from local farmers, that picks things up out of the valley, carries them into the hilltops. And honestly, if anyone's familiar with the region, you know that we can go all night. Everything that's named from the Sasquatch and the Tennessee wild man can also pick up names like that of the Roamer or the Help me out here. There's more. <laughs> uh, there's a skunk ape down in there's Florida. There's a skunk ape. It smells bad. It's tall, red eyes. That sounds like a skunk ape mm -hmm. to me. Very true. Uh, Andre the Giant. I don't know if he smells bad. He seems like he was a nice guy. I hate you. <laughs> Local legend also tells of these troglodyte creatures. Things that may have been human at one point, but after years and years of living in the caves of these hills, have adapted to grow hair all over their body for warmth and these deep white faces with big glowing red eyes to see at night. When the sun sets, they arise from their caves and go out, go out into the hillside to hunt down animals or potentially people before dragging them back to their nest and to feed during the daytime. And the stories really aren't limited to Tennessee. Much of the Old South has similar stories to this. For example, the Seminole people of Florida had the SD Kapkaki, which was described as a large, hairy man who carried a club and smelled foul. Furthermore, descriptions like that allude to concepts that we know today, something like the skunk ape, a creature that wanders the swamplands of Florida and terrorizes animals and people alike. And for those who are familiar with American folklore, you know that we can go all night. Stories range coast to coast of these hairy, glowing-eyed people who come out at night to terrorize those of us who are awake during the day. Several of the local legends that I've grown up with personally are the stories that my grandfather would tell me, that of the tree people. When I was young, he would tell me that there are these people, a little bit taller than humans, that exist among the tree line. And they were also known as tree knockers 
because you could always hear them coming by the distinctive knocking noise they would make on the trees to communicate with one another. My grandfather told me that if I ever came into contact with one of them, not to trust it. They'll offer you gifts and give you promises of anything your heart could desire, but they'll never offer it. All that happens is they take young children who give in to their whims, take them into the tree line to never be seen again. Which falls quite in line with Celtic folklore and stories of the Fae folk. We'll That's often true. offer gifts and whatnot to people in exchange for their thanks. That thanks, of course, forever indebts you to the Fae. And that would make sense because a large percentage of the Appalachian culture, the people who inhabit this area, comes from places like Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, where these legends originated. It's interesting to see how concepts from the old world, so to speak, and places like the United Kingdom, whenever they came over here, it sort of merged with legends mm -hmm. that already existed to these entirely new creatures. Exactly. Legends between my friends of creatures like the Roamer that stalks the rivers and tree lines of Tennessee and North Carolina, looking for those who decide to travel alone. Now, something that's interesting about legends I grew up with, like that of the tree people or the Roamer, or tales of things like the Skunk Ape, Sasquatch, and the Tennessee Wild Man, is that while in some stories the creature seems to be this hostile entity, it's not in all of them. Some of the most common stories I've heard of the Tennessee Wild Man is that he'll simply wait in the tree line outside of people's houses, and that whenever the person goes to the window to look outside at night, for a quick glimpse they'll see two red eyes looking back at them before it turns and darts away into the tree line. This narrative continues into several tales that relate to the wild man stealing women and children, perhaps not out of some act of malice, but as some act of companionship. Several of the legends, like that mentioned in Native American folklore, paint the creature to not be this hostile entity looking to destroy man, but as some lonely creature looking to build a family. Now while this offers little reprieve to those who may fall victim to these creatures, it does paint the idea that perhaps the creatures, just like the mountains they inhabit, aren't so much evil as they are forgotten. Now with the case of Dennis Martin, we're not implying that he was taken by the Tennessee wild man or the roamer or some form of bipedal primal creature. But what we are saying is that it's not the first time that someone's gone missing in Appalachia and the stories just kind of seem to write themselves. Details like the couple seeing a hairy man carry him into the tree line, details like the feet that have one shoe and one bare foot, a little too large to be that of Dennis's. The three days of radio silence from the United States Army Special Forces also doesn't help. All paint the picture of something that people from the region have seen before. And while again, it doesn't necessarily provide an answer to what happened to Dennis Martin, it definitely shows that people are desperate for one, and perhaps desperate enough to conjure up their own nightmare. Regardless of your own beliefs about Dennis Martin, we can all agree it's an example of America's unexplainable. These hills, with their hopes and horrors from generations long since past, seem to come up with their new form of monster every day. And perhaps the most disturbing thing about the Dennis Martin case isn't the unfortunate or unlikely nature of it, but the fact that it will almost definitely happen again. And as nature continues to show us the unexplainable, it's only natural that the people of these mountains will continue to build the legend of America's Boogeyman. But even if you think I'm ridiculous and all this talk of Wild Men and Dennis Martin is also ridiculous, which it almost certainly is, I'm still glad you're here because you're still watching and I greatly appreciate that. And to everyone who's here, I just want to say thank you for watching. For those who saw my original Missing 411 video and were upset that I didn't make a follow-up quickly thereafter, I apologize for the hiatus, but as you can probably see from this video, I wanted this series to be something special. I make enough videos sitting in a corner and talking about things, so if I have the opportunity to explore something like this on location, then I might as well go out and make it mean something. So if you enjoyed videos like this, then let me know because I would be more than happy to do things like this in the future. And also, I know I mentioned it a lot in the beginning, but to confirm, you should definitely go follow The Lore Lodge on YouTube. They're great people. If it wasn't for Aiden and Aiden being able to come down and help me out with this case, I never would have been able to make this video to the degree that I did. So go over to their channel, tell them thank you, and also in probably a couple weeks after this video comes out, they're going to be doing a behind the scene video that's more of 
our funny or blooper moments we had while we were doing this investigation and everything that goes into making one of these videos. So if that sounds interesting to you, which you should already be doing this anyway, check out their channel in the description and go subscribe to it. They definitely deserve it. I also just got back from the set of Stalker's Shadow of the Zone, the movie that your much appreciated Kickstarter money was able to fund. And I have to say, I couldn't be happier with it. Uh, not only getting to work with friends of mine like Steven and Evan, but also getting to meet all of these incredible people in the film industry and making connections and friendships that will hopefully last a lifetime. And also to see the film uh, that came together between all of the actors and the crew who were dedicated to the project. And it's, it's in the editing stages. Like, I, I have an idea of what it will turn out as, but I haven't seen the finished project, project yet. But just from seeing the reels that we recorded, I know this is going to be something special, and that's all thanks to you all, and it means the most. We're still on track to have it out in summer of 2023, so six-ish months from now. Uh, and whenever that happens, there'll be a bunch of announcements. I am working my best to try to get some premieres going for it. Um, again, it's a fan film. We're not going to be able to sell tickets and, you know, sell it all over the country. But I think it'd be cool to set up a sort of fundraiser or a charity drive for it. Um, and if we can make that happen, that would be really cool. And because I feel like you guys who donated to the project, the least you could do is be able to go and see it in person. And I think that would be really neat. And you guys are really neat for making this movie happen and it means the world, so thank you. Uh, but I've done enough rambling for now. Again, hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know in the comments and hopefully I'll do more of this. I already have like three or four of these kind of in the field videos lined up in my head. Uh, so if you want to see more of them, let me know and I will get to it. Um, but that should do it for now. So I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed and I will see you in the next one. Bye.